is it with the kittens? Every time I open my mouth, I kill a kitten. I can't open my mouth. <laughs> we'll never be the fake news media. Always fair and balanced. Do you have anything to say? 877-225-8587. And look who's next. Do you believe they said every time I open well, my mouth, I kill a kitten, Laura Ingram? Well, Hannity, first of all, why is it that all of the people who call into the Hannity hate line, why are you yeah. calling it hotlines, the hate line, they're all half in the bag. These people are blotto <laughs> drunk. <laughs> if they're, they're in the half the in the bag for my show, they're wasted by your show. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, 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 that's good for me, actually. I'm, I'm, that's good for all of us. I agree. Yeah, that's there's, fine. There's, there are kitten, there's kitten in, kittens involved. There's, there's Every time I open stuffs. my mouth, I kill a kitten? Ouch. Well, that's it. Yeah, that's that's usually left for Barbara Streisand or someone like that oh. when they're on stage. So I can't believe you're you're really in that pantheon, Hannity. Good job, Ouch. man. All right, great well, welcome tonight. back. By the way, have a great show. All right, good to see you. Thanks, Sean. And welcome everybody to the Ingram Angle. I'm Laura Ingram in Washington. Lots of news to unpack for you tonight. We have a big show on tap. Anthony Scaramucci is here, straight ahead. To dish on Bannon, Fusion GPS, and his own future. And later, my thoughts on the Golden Globes and candidate Winfrey. But first, we start tonight with President Trump showing the world what a real leader looks like, chairing a bipartisan meeting on DACA in front of the cameras. The president left no doubt as to who's running the show in Washington and the future of immigration. That's the focus of tonight's angle. Today, President Trump met with congressional leaders, Republicans and Democrats, on that thorny issue of immigration. And he did something we don't see often in Washington. He let the press in to film some of the discussions, almost an hour. I mean, look at Dick Durbin. He doesn't look all that thrilled, but he's one of the president's most vicious critics sitting right next to the president. As I've been saying for many years, many years, during the anti-amnesty battles of 2006, 7, and 2014, the people have a right to see where everybody's cards are in this game of high-stakes poker for the nation. And the president made sure that happened in quite a respectful manner. This was an idea I had last week. I was sitting with some of our great Republican senators, and we all agreed on everything. Let's have the same meeting, but let's add the Democrats. Dick, perhaps you'd like to say a few words? We can come together and reach an agreement. And when that happens, I think good things will happen in other places. Tom, would you like to say something? I hope that this meeting can be the beginning of building trust between our parties, between the chambers. Um, because I know, for fact, all the Republicans around the table are committed to finding a solution, and I believe all the Democrats are as well. Bob, where are you with the bill? You've challenged us, and we should step up to that challenge, and we're going to uh, do it in a bipartisan fashion, but we have to put our best uh, foot forward. Setting aside the substance of the negotiations for just a moment, one thing is abundantly clear after today. That media story that they've been peddling for days and weeks and even months that the president doesn't have a, a handle on things. Well, he was clearly in command. He was gracious. And I think he couldn't have been kinder to the 22 legislators in attendance. Yet, look at the way the Washington Post headline characterized the event. We got a glimpse of Trump negotiating today. It didn't go well. <laughs> that is just absolutely pathetic. As usual, President Trump is like a powerful political astringent. He's trying in good faith to include Democrats in the process. And what does he get for it? Nothing but grief from the media. Now, remember when President Obama had his one measly roundtable at Blair House with Republicans before the Obamacare vote? Treat all Americans the same under provisions of the law so that they will know that geography does not dictate what kind of health care they would receive. I thank you, Mr. President. Let me, uh, let me just make this point, John, uh, because we're not campaigning anymore. The election's over. That went well. Well, today at the White House, the petty gutter dweller author, Michael Wolff, became even smaller. And I'm not talking about his diminutive stature either. I'm referring to Wolff's phony narrative that President Trump is somehow not mentally equipped for the job. Today we saw he's sharp, he's savvy, and he's really impatient for solutions for the American people. If anything, it's Washington that's not able to keep up with his pace. The bureaucracy moves too slowly for Trump. And all that he wants to get done, it's hard to get done with how glacially this whole thing goes. So 
I think it's about time that the Trump-hating media and the political elites, why not have their own fitness for their own jobs examined? Call me crazy, but I actually think your abilities and your fitness should be measured by your track record and your accomplishments or lack thereof. Think for a moment about the politicians in both parties as well who've failed their constituents with stupid policies and ideas that did zero except waste our hard-earned money or suffocate economic opportunity. Just look at the crime in Chicago and Baltimore, the homelessness, the epidemic we're seeing of it in San Francisco and L.A. And as for the press, let's forget, let's not forget that most of them were embarrassed by their predictions of President Hillary. And they're still failing their readers and their viewers with the same old tropes that they tried against Trump in 2016. How can you be a race-baiting, xenophobic bigot? which Donald Trump is, two or three months before any Republicans voted. Donald Trump started talking about the Muslim ban. I knew immediately, at that moment, and said at that moment, I, I can never vote for this guy. And I let everybody know, I was voting for Jeb Bush, and Jeb lost. I'm sorry. And he's saying Trump is kind of out of it? Jeb Bush? He couldn't win his home state, Joe. I mean, imagine if instead of elevating these spurious claims of a nasty crackpot journalist, reporters spent more time getting to understand the hopes and dreams of Americans who are outside of the Acela Corridor. Get out of the bubble, boys. I actually think Trump is really growing into the job quite well, thank you very much. By any objective measure, he's accomplished more and more good for the country in one year than I, I believe most other presidents in my lifetime. And now, uh, as for the actual policy analysis of what this bipartisan gaggle may do on immigration, there were some good signs and some uh, not so good signs today. First, let's talk about the positive. The president reiterated his must-haves in any DACA deal. We need a wall. It has to be a bill to end chain migration, cancel the lottery program. Those three things are paramount. Well, in a perfect world, we would have enough Republicans, and even a few Democrats maybe, who would pass the RAISE Act, that Tom Cotton, Senator Perdue Act, before we took any steps toward rewarding those who are in the country illegally. Citizenship shouldn't be bargained away for some uh, song uh, with maybe a green card. Shouldn't do it. Now to the concerning part of the DACA roundtable. This should be a bipartisan bill. This should be a bill of love. Truly, it should be a bill of love, and we can do that. When this group comes back, hopefully with an agreement, this group and others from the Senate, from the House, comes back with an agreement, I'm signing it. I mean, I will be signing it. I'm not going to say, oh, gee, I want this or I want that. I'll be signing it. Oh, wait a second. I, I hope the president hasn't been reading that Jeb Bush immigration book. Remember in 2014, when Jeb described illegal immigration as an act of love? Well, like clockwork, Jeb Bush tweeted today, encourage the president is seeking bipartisan solutions to our immigration challenges. I'll bet. <laughs> Color me concerned. Well, while the president seems eager to do a DACA deal, I would caution that this is not the reason why he won. The American people elected him to protect their security and well-being first. So I have five thoughts for the president and the GOP. Number one, focus on how immigration affects the American worker in the language that you use, even when you talk about doing something for the DACA so-called kids. Number two, Trump won because his position on immigration differed from everyone else's in that room for the most part. So we need to keep the focus on what's good for American citizens and legal immigrants. Law and order, my friends, remains popular, necessary to the Trump agenda. Number three, let's everyone be honest that passing DACA, well, it's not going to be some magic elixir for Americans. The GOP is going to be drummed out of office if they're seen as being more compassionate toward illegals than they are toward American citizens. And number four, if we don't change our legal immigration system and fast, the melting pot will break beyond repair. Assimilation, patriotic immigration, and merit must be central to any discussion. If we don't get this right, we won't be two countries. We're going to be 10 countries. Number five, 
If Republicans can't get Democrats to agree on chain migration, getting rid of it, we really know that they care more about illegal immigrants than the working Americans. That'll be good for Republicans. Of course, it'd be bad for the country. Remember, the U.S. went from 9 million immigrants to 45 million immigrants coming in in just a half a century. That was the largest movement of people in the history of the world. So whatever they finally agree on, after today, we should all agree on this. The president is fully engaged and fully committed to the tricky and often unpleasant process of shaking up Washington. If he can get these entrenched elites in D.C. to secure this border and focus on the needs of the American people in the immigration debate, that alone will be a massive victory for this president and for the country. As the details of this DACA plan unfold, we're going to be watching and very closely. And that's the angle. For reaction, let's bring in our guests, columnist for the Washington Examiner and Fox News contributor Byron York here in Washington, also here in Washington, Washington Times opinion editor and Fox News contributor Charlie Hurt, and in Miami, five-time Emmy award-winning journalist Elvira Salazar, currently the anchor of Mega TV's nightly news newscast. Great to see all of you. Um, see you. Elvira, Thank let's you. start with you. let's start with you on this. Um, the president. The president pleased Jeb Bush today with his approach to immigration. He looked, to me, very in command of the room. He was looking like he wanted to come up with some solution. I, might, I may not love the solution in the end, but, boy, he seems to want to get to results and bring all parties to the table. And we are very happy about that, and good evening, and thanks for inviting me. I wrote at the beginning of this year, and for Newsmax, that Trump was going to be for immigration what Nixon was for China. Only somebody that is such an anti-staunch, anti-legal immigration could pave the way, as we saw today, to acquire and to be able to achieve something that has not been able to be done in the last 30 years which is to not only to give some type of legality to the DACA kids, but to take care of the 11 million people. And, uh, and that we can, we can go into that discussion. How are we going to do that? But President Trump showed today that he is willing to put political capital, capital that he has, and now political willingness to solve the problem, starting with the DACA kids. Charlie Hurt, uh, when I hear the president say we're going to do a DACA deal, to me that removes the leverage because if someone knows that you're going to do the deal, well, where's, I, your, where's I, your leverage I, there? I'm a little concerned about that. I mean, the focus should be on the American people first, I, what's good for them. I, I'm totally concerned as well. Uh, but if, if in, in the, at the end of the day what he's trying to do is he's luring Democrats into negotiating all this and then, and then at the end of the day they refuse to go along with it because it has security measures in it, then he can beat them up about it. But what I think was most interesting about this thing today, for an hour, <clears throat> Donald Trump opened up that meeting so that the American people could see what, what politicians, when they get behind closed doors, talking about this stuff. All they talked about was DACA. They must have said DACA a thousand times. Yeah, where was all the other times. stuff? The judge, immigration judges? And all like, the other people. Yeah. All the other people that are affected by Im the illegal immigration. None of that ever got brought up. All everybody could agree upon was DACA. And if Republicans go along with this and do some sort of DACA deal that doesn't include serious enforcement, including chain migration, yeah. it's gonna, they're going to the be The DHS done. Secretary Byron said, well, enforcement has to be part yeah. of the deal. Yeah. I heard that really, I was yeah. on the plane, a five-hour delay coming back from Atlanta, that was fun. So I was sitting there like trying to pull stuff up on YouTube and I'm, I heard that like, wait, part of the deal? <laughs> Enforcement is a solemn obligation of this government and it can't be in the future. It's got to be real and meaningful and Trump said the wall. Yeah, I did not see any agreement taking place at this meeting. And there was the, the section that worried a lot of immigration harder liners was this exchange between Senator Feinstein and the president. And Senator Feinstein did the classic Democratic strategy, which is, why don't you give us everything we want first, and then we'll talk about what you want. And it sounded as if the president agreed with that. And then I, you know I watched it, and happen. then I read the transcript. Well, let's play it, guys. Let's play it. We actually have the exchange, that's, okay. so let's let's let our, our viewers watch. Then you can comment, Elvira. Uh, All so, right. We, well, what, what, I'll just read it because it's quicker. So the president said, "I have no problem. I think basically, 
Uh, I think that's basically what Dick is saying. Well, Dick's, Dick, what Dick Durbin was saying, let's do a clean DACA, I right? Think, uh, yes. But so I, wait, I, I read the president it, now with Dick Durbin I watched on immigration? I, the transcript. I missed I think that when, part of the when campaign. When the president says DACA, he means DACA, wall, chain migration, and visa law. Yeah, and I'm going to hear that's a lot of making yeah, but, tomorrow. Yeah. You see, what, what you guys, I think what you guys are missing. Yeah. What we're missing here is that we we got to we got to put this to rest. We got to finish with this DACA immigration deal so we can move on and do a, other things. You know, we in the Hispanic community, and I do represent millions of us and people that think like me, is that we don't like this, this to keep on talking about this immigration. We want to put an end to it. We want some type oh, of sure immigration reform law yeah. that I'm will sure that will include not necessarily citizenship, but some type yeah. of legality, right. not only well, for the I DACA have a question kids. For you. I, f I have a question for you. Elvira, do you think that the yes. DACA people who are upwards of 37, 38 years old now, should they then be allowed to bring in their aunts, uncles, cousins twice removed, like the chain migration, that, that spider web of people who come in? Should that I all believe, be part of and this? I know and I know where you're going. I believe that, first of all, we're talking about 16, from 16-year-old 16 to 30-year-old, 800,000 kids, I mean, young adults, that are, most of kids. them are yeah. working. Okay, they're kids, you know, they're working. But the, the main problem here is that they did not know that they were breaking the law. And, you know, we well, are Americans, right. and we are the beacon of, of human rights. So if you do not know, because you are too little to understand, yeah. not only that, you're fully assimilated. assimilated. You speak well, English. You forgot how to speak Spanish. You're yeah, working. That, you're not a gang the, member. The jury is I mean, you know, those are that. merits. I mean, yeah, we got 2,300 right, criminals as, as, as members of the, that, that have been and if, caught And then, you know, they should be out of here. Yeah, so we don't want criminals. The question on chain migration, which is what the, the really, kids, okay. to me, that's an explosion. Yeah, the, so should Parents the parents of the DACA, should they be able to stay? Right, They're so, also illegal. The, okay, yes. well. So that's 1.8 million people who will be allowed to stay here legally. That's a big number. Let Charlie get on this. Big and, number jump from 800,000. Well, hold on, hold let on. Let me answer ahead. you. And that was one of the right, very things you. that I think came out of this uh, yeah. meeting today was Donald Trump said, look, I'm going to campaign on this. I'm going to make it a pol political issue. I'm, uh, Democrats can't defend chain migration. Yeah. But one other thing about the uh, DACA is real I quick. get that. Uh, we'll, we'll go ahead. Uh, yeah. he, he, and has, real quick. he has to campaign on this. Remember, there are 49 Democrats in the Senate. They're all opposed to this. There are four Republican yeah. senators who have signed on to this clean uh, DACA a dream disastrous. act. Disastrous. Flake. That's McCain, 53. Who, who, yeah, uh, really it, is, it is Corey Flake. Gardner, yeah. Flake. Oh, my God, Cory Gardner. Well, Lindsay, when he's not pushing Lindsay pot Graham legalization, and Lisa he's Murkowski. for the illegal aliens. Yeah. Elvira, really quickly, this is a chain migration this be is part? A thorny. So, okay, this is, this is a scenario. Quick. It's like for me to be able to save my child, I need to leave him. And, you know, that's not a very pleasant position well, to well, be in. Elvira, and I yeah, understand okay. what you're saying. Yeah, well, Elvira, here's I, the I problem. When, when, when criminals in the United States, when they commit a crime, guess what? They're separated from their children. That's called repercussions for violating our law. So this idea that everybody's a saint that comes I in got as it, a legal but immigrant. You know, Everyone's system. a valedictorian and saving cats from <laughs> trees. System, and regular workers system, have to suck it up, buttercup. I just think it's ridiculous. I'm and sorry. That's got what, it. That's but what the Trump system won. Well, what allow them. And what about or, the culpability the system of the allow them. Let me just say this. Yeah, the parents don't have any culpability. for the parents. Got yeah. it. No, no, the parents do. The parents broke yeah. the law, but you know right, the guys, system allowed them to stay here yeah. for more than 10 years. Yeah, well, right. yeah, well, that, it was, it's all a scam. The, the American system. people elected Republican Donald Trump Democrats to end this scam. Uh, I appreciate Elvira, Byron. Uh, we could have you guys you. on for an hour. This is why I want longer segments. Uh, thank you, guys. By the way, coming up, there are rumors that Anthony Scaramucci may return to the White House. The mooch when we come back. Two big shockers. Steve Bannon is out at Breitbart, and Anthony Scaramucci may be back at the White House. Joining us now from New York. I wish he was here. Me too. Anthony, Anthony Scaramucci. Hey, Anthony, how you doing? Good to hey, see you. Happy, happy New, New Year. Year. Happy New Year. Congratulations on your unbelievable show, Laura. God oh, bless you. Oh, thank you. You got to come awesome. on more. You got to come on more. I've, um, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. Let's make this not the last time. How's that? Fantastic. Uh, let's let's talk about you and the White House. I'm reading all these stories and reports that. You're, you talk to the president regularly. He has an enormous amount of respect and affection for well, you. I, I, there's, I, I, there's some desire to bring you back in. The White House is kind of being I, coy about it. Gee, okay, so I, that's all news to me. I have not heard any of that. And so I sort of addressed that on Howie's show over the weekend. I sort of think it's a little bit of nonsense. Uh, I'm not per, a presumptuous person. Um, I don't expect to go back to the White House. I certainly said on the air 
I didn't think General Kelly would want to hire me back, although I think he's doing a great job, by the way. I just think that at the end of the day, they seem to be doing a great job. I thought today's communication strategy was absolutely brilliant, so my hat's off to them for allowing the American people to see the president, Laura, the way you know the president, the way I know the president, uh, and his extreme, quote-unquote, presidential nature, which you saw today for 45 or 46 minutes. So, Don't you love uh, wanna... Scaramucci? Don't you love how the left keeps saying he is mentally unstable? It's, it's, they are it's... so desperate to try to so... discount his successes and accomplishments. They are getting, and, and it's what's funny about this is that they're the ones becoming more and more unhinged yeah. And I think mentally something, I don't say unstable, but I don't, but I don't want to give them a, almost. I don't want to give them a lot of advice on your unbelievably popular, well-rated show, <laughs> because I know that they're listening. But if, if the advice I would give them is you should sort of stop that because you're playing right into the president's hands. He wants you to go fully off the rails. He wants you to go crazy on him every single day and night because you look so disingenuous and you look so emotionally involved in it to the point where you've lost your objectivity completely. And so uh, that's part of the whole derangement syndrome that goes on. Uh, and yeah. the president is sure, surely stoking that, uh, describing <laughs> himself as a stable genius. I, I thought that was terrific. I've added that to my vernacular now, although my family members view me as an unstable, <laughs> non-genius. Yeah, I don't think so, Mooch. I don't but think But that's you okay. That. My, I'm my, just teasing my, you. No, but my point, my point is, is that at the end of the day, uh, he's doing a great job. You know it. I know he's doing a great job. Oh, it's I, think, I think the Democrats tonight are going back to their boardrooms, wherever they go, and they're looking at each other saying, okay, this is a problem for us. Say, yeah. The guy looks unbelievably presidential today. Now, and now tonight, tonight you were on CNN, and you said something. I was watching you. You said something interesting. Let's watch. Okay. To really understand the president, you know, there's a nuance to him there as well. He is a globalist by nature. He wants to be part of the world order. Okay, globalist by nature, part of the world order. Now, mm -hmm. I hear that, and I think of the speech he gave not so long ago. I think it was at the UN. Let's listen. Let's watch. Both our friends and our enemies put their countries above ours. And we, while being fair to them, must start doing the same. We will no longer surrender this country or its people to the false song of globalism. Okay, which is the real President Trump? Okay, he said so, he's a globalist. So, he said he's against the, so, this globalist approach to so affairs got, and for American sovereignty. Okay, so I got cut off a little bit over there, uh, and so let me finish it over here. What I was basically trying to say is that there's a duality to the president. He, he has a globalist streak in his personality where he wants to be part of the world order. He wants to give speeches at the U.N. He's going to Davos uh, in two weeks. He recognizes that the international system can lead to global peace and prosperity. At the same time, superseding all of that is his America first strategy and taking care of the American worker, American businesses, American families, infrastructure, and et cetera. Uh, he gave an interview with the uh, Financial Times about five or six months ago, Laura, where he basically explained that duality in his personality. And so I was trying to get that out over there. Uh, yeah. well, Thank yeah. you for letting me get it out over here. But I would that, say he's a, he's a yeah. U.S. person first, America first. But I do think, as evidenced by what he's doing in two weeks and his U.N. speeches, that he does want to participate well, in the course. global community. He's and the not global an isolationist. System. Of course he's not an isolationist. But my point is he has specifically campaigned against the philosophy of globalism, because globalism is a, a philosophy that kind of erases national borders, national cultures, and national that, identities that strand of it, to yes. a global order. When I hear global order, I hear, you know, watch your yeah. freedom, watch your independence. But I, I get Okay, I, I okay get but that's a, that's, a vernac saying. that's a vernacular now yeah. that's sort of twisted that barbed wire. When I talk about the global yeah. order, I talk about uh, what, you know, our allies, the strength of our allies, hand-checking hard our adversaries, and yeah, keeping the peace. That's not Obama's peace. globalism, though. That's a not, that's not a, Obama's, yeah. not a right, Obama's globalism. But going back to like a Kissinger uh, slash Dean Atkinson approach to Atkinson, keeping yeah. the peace. All right, we do Anthony have 71 Scar years of peace, so let's keep that's it. That's for sure. Great to see you. Uh, Thank you for and by me. the way, Anthony, did you catch that college championship game last night? I did. I was there. It wasn't just a moment to savor for Alabama fans, though savor it we did. One of the best moments on the field came before the game. We're going to share you, share with you what it means when we return.
Last night's college football championship wasn't just a great game, Roll Tide. Uh, before it started, there was not only the presentation of the colors and a salute to the military, but President Trump made a point of standing midfield for the anthem. To discuss the impact of that moment, we're joined by Joe Theismann, who quarterbacked the Washington Redskins to a Super Bowl victory in 1982. Boy, do we miss you, Joe. Uh, he's in Scottsdale, Arizona. <laughs> And, of course, it's great to see you, Joe. I'm such a big fan. Uh, and, by the way, the president walked out with those uh, ROTC uh, members, members of the military, with salute to wounded veterans and veterans, uh, uh, military folks. It was just a, it was a beautiful moment. It was overwhelming cheers in the stadium. There are a few boos from misguided uh, college students, but overwhelmingly, it was a huge positive reaction. What did you think in watching that and comparing that to the NFL and what we've seen this season with a drop-off in viewership and so forth? Well, Neil, Laura, just, just listening to you describe it, I get goosebumps because it was such an incredible moment of a celebration of a great nation and what we represent and what it's all about. Um, I had the opportunity to play in front of President Jimmy Carter, and I can tell you something. When the president's in attendance, it's a different type of a game. But to see so many people celebrate this great flag, this great country of ours, and, and the NFL has, you know, taken a hit for it. I think their viewership is down. Uh, there are a lot of people that have served this country, country. There are a lot of people that have sacrificed and had family members that have sacrificed for the freedoms that we have. And that's sort of the double-edged sword a little bit. The flag stands for something very special. It stands for those people that have sacrificed to allow us to be who we are and have the freedoms that we have. And uh, to me, I've never, I never agreed with the, some of the things that the players have done, but yet they do have the right to be able to do that because that's what the freedom for the flag was all about. But to see the president out there last night at that football game, he's a huge fan. He's a fan of sports. He's a fan of football. And uh, to see him at that game, I think, was very, very special. Yeah, and Joe, by the way, they, uh, I, was in, uh, I was lucky enough to get tickets to the game and sat with, around some amazing people, old players and uh, family members of the old athletic director and a former coach at West Point. He uh, played for Bear Bryant, Bill Battle. So I sat with his family. Just amazing people, so patriotic. And I can tell you when they show the, the soldiers in Kandahar and, and, you know, of course, in Afghanistan and then in, in Iraq, I think they showed the soldiers in Iraq as well, it, the stadium went just crazy for the soldiers, for the troops. And that... And, they, and you know, they have, Laura. And that's, that's the thing, I think... The, the support of, of what is going on, the, the opportunity to be able to voice your opinion in a positive way about the men and women that fight for our freedom, um, the police officers, the first responders, yeah. the firemen, those people that put themselves in harm's way, it, it's a special breed of people. They don't know when they wake up the next morning what the day is going to hold in store for them. And that's why I think they should be honored, and that's why the flag well, honors them. It. Yeah. It's a little way we can do it at home. Well, of course, has, something has to happen before the game, which as an Alabama f fan, I was beyond outraged by, so upset, is when that clip emerged from the running back, Bo Scarborough, and we have a little snippet from it. Let's watch. Uh, we had to bleep it, but he says blank, blank Trump as they were walking into the stadium. And that made the rounds. And it was rumored that he was benched. I, I, I don't know if he, have you, do you know if he was benched or not? I don't think it was. I don't know. Was he benched for the game? I don't even know. No, he he, no, he, wa he wasn't. Yeah. He wasn't benched for the game. It's just wrong. I mean, it, it just shows. But disrespect. Joe, Joe, you're a straightforward guy. I got I to ask you, straightforward guy. Should he have been benched? That's what young people are seeing the day after that phenomenal game, one of the greatest uh, playoff games, championship games ever, bowl games. That was one of the great games. And, I, you know, all of us I, who were there felt like we we're so privileged. That clip, if I were Saban, I would have said, you know something? Take a seat. You can't hold your tongue going into the going. You can't hold your tongue. Are you kidding me? I would have I would have benched him. And I know I had a chance of meeting Nick Saban. I'm surprised he didn't. Well, you know, I'm not, I'm not surprised because, co you know, look at a lot of different things that have happened on football teams, on different types of teams where people have been able to, yeah. to say and do things. It's unfortunately, Laura, it's part of what's become a norm in society today, an expression of, of any type. But to me, you disrespect, you disrespect the office, you disrespect the person. And um, the school. It's everybody's, enti everybody's entitled to have an opinion. 
But there's a respectful that's way to do things. That's not an opinion. That's and stupidity. It's not an opinion. That's, it is stupid. That's and, profanity and, 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 you know, and stupidity. I'm sorry. It's both. And thinking about it, I probably would have said, I'm sorry, you can't play in this game. I would now, have what said he that. Said I, I, you know what he said instead? You know, not talking about Saban. Bo Scarborough then compounded the problem by claiming in a tweet that he was talking about Georgia. <laughs> he wasn't talking about Georgia. He said, y'all promise I didn't say anything about the president. I did say something I shouldn't have said about Georgia, and I'm sorry for that. No, he didn't. He said Trump. You can hear it very clearly in the tape. I mean, so anyway, look, I don't want to, there was an amazing game. President Trump was great there. The troops were, were honored. So all of that was incredible. But that moment, that's, that was a disappointment. That, I mean, that was, that, and these guys are, are lucky and privileged to be but playing is, for but, such a great team and a great coach. But what a, spectac what a spectacular evening. Both Alabama and Georgia played their heart out. And I will say this. The pass the young man from Alabama threw that would tied the football games, I believe he was throwing it to the guy behind the guy that caught it. Oh, oh, okay, Joe. I, well, I, was, if you I take, was sitting there and look, I didn't see that. Take a look, at, take a look, look at that clip again. Take a look at it again because he throws it into a space where I believe he's throwing it to the guy that's hooking up behind him. All right. And all of a sudden, the other guy shows up and here we are today. Alabama's well, another I national championship. I had several heart attacks in the stands, several heart attacks last <laughs> night. But Georgia played a great game and, and, and I felt bad for the Georgia fans. So, But it, it, was, it, was a, it was an amazing night. Joe, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And by the way, when he bragged that he had a bigger nuclear button than Kim Jong-un, the experts predicted the president was stoking war with North Korea. Well, wait until you hear what's happening now. Up next. Welcome back to our new and recurring segment, The Experts. Remember those prophecies of gloom and doom following President Trump's tweet that his nuclear button was bigger than Rocket Man's? We all live in a world that could literally be ended uh, in terms of a habitable planet because well, of the sad man's insecurity. It's like somebody hasn't told him uh, how this is reading to the rest of the world. His potential mental instability has actually now intersected with the single most dangerous potential issue that faces us all as humans on the planet. This isn't 3D chess. This is a child getting angry and knocking the board over. Can we retire the 3D chess? <laughs> verbiage. I'm tired of that. So maybe those experts can explain this. North Korea suddenly meeting with South Korea to reduce military tensions, a thaw in relations. Here to react, Gordon Chang, author of the 2006 book, Nuclear Showdown, North Korea Takes on the World. And with me in Washington, Michael Fuchs, who is a senior fellow at the Center for American Progress. Michael, let's go right to you. Predictions of doom and gloom. It's all going to end. Trump is a disaster on foreign policy. Suddenly, uh, Kim Jong-un's people are talking to the South Koreans. They're going to go to the Olympics. Well, look, I think this is clearly a good development here. The North and the South are talking. That is good. Diplomacy is the only way we're going to solve this threat in North Korea. I think that President Trump's comments to date have unfortunately exacerbated the problem. And I think what we're seeing out of Kim Jong-un reaching out to the South right now is actually trying to pro poke and prod for weakness in the alliance between South Korea and the United States. He sees some of the errant tweets coming from the president so of the United States. So he's meeting with the South because of the tweets? Well, exactly. That's a good thing, right? So isn't that couldn't be reverse psychology from Trump? Well, look, I'll take it uh, okay. right now. Um, but again, I'm more scared of President Trump's tweets uh, uh, than I am. Uh, than Kim Jong-un. Uh, no, 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 you not at all. Are. No, I'm joking. I'm teasing. <laughs> Let's go to Gordon Chang real quickly. Gordon, uh, your quick take on this. Well, I think Kim Jong-un understands that sanctions are hurting his regime. Those are U.N. sanctions that have been put in place because of the Trump administration, plus also unilateral U.S. sanctions. Um, and we see this. Kim Jong-un, in his New Year's address, talked about sanctions being an existential threat to his yeah. government. Also, there's anecdotal evidence of just so many instances of people not getting money. So this is a real indication that the underlying Trump policy of cutting off money to the North Korean regime is actually starting to work. And that's one of the reasons why Kim Jong-un wants to talk to the South Koreans, because he wants the South Koreans to pay them cash. All right, Michael, closing thoughts real quick. Well, look, I think that this is a potential opportunity for the United States. The real question now is what does the Trump administration do? Are they able to stay in lockstep coordination with our ally in South Korea and try to actually start U.S.-North Korea ah, diplomacy? Very interesting. Which is the only way we're going to really address this. All right, gentlemen, we'll have you back for an extended discussion. And by the way, I know you guys were watching the Golden Globes the other night with popcorn and some big super gulps. 
Uh, up next, Oprah. Oh, her future. I all comment and a lot more. Welcome back. The little wolf and the black dresses. That's the focus of my bonus angle. First, I was remiss on Friday because I did not mention the part of that Michael Wolf screed that mentioned yours truly. It's just a small anecdote that claimed that at the funeral of former Fox News chairman Roger Ailes, quote, right wing professionals remain passionate in their outward defense of Trump, but were rattled, if not abashed, among one another. At the funeral, Rush Limbaugh and Laura Ingram struggled to parse support for Trumpism, even, even as they distanced themselves from Trump himself. Okay, I can tell you that that is totally fabricated. It never happened. And by the way, it's really poorly written. What does parsing support even mean? And after talking to others who were there, I can tell you that Trump wasn't really even discussed much, if at all, at the funeral. But Wolf didn't care. He wanted to advance his rickety anti-Trump agenda. The facts be damned. He didn't care. And no, I didn't buy the stupid book. I borrowed someone else's. All right, second, the Golden Globes. For once, I wasn't in the slightest annoyed when my cable went out on Sunday night. I have one of those systems. They're supposed to be so great. They control all the TVs. It never works. I was blissfully unaware of that hashtag times up in those black dress declarations by women who, for the most part, just happened to be a bunch of left-wing Democrats. Same women who were mostly silent during Harvey Weinstein's reign of sexual terror. Excuse me, but watching a bunch of self-absorbed actresses try to one-up each other with emoting and conjured-up empathy isn't exactly my idea of a fun Sunday night. That Time's Up group, led by left-wing industry types, announced before the show that they'd all be wearing black to protest men who harass women. There wasn't much of a mention of women who harass men, as I recall. Imagine the pressure on young actresses in attendance to conform. Not only are so many in the industry afraid to express views that may be remotely conservative, now they're afraid to dress the way they want to dress and the color they want to wear. So how is it any less demeaning and domineering for a bunch of powerful women to tell other women what to wear than it is for powerful men to do the same? Answer, it's not. And as for resulting in some tangible change for the farm workers and the hospitality workers, well, I'll let Rose McGowan, the actress largely responsible for blowing the whistle on the sleaze in Hollywood, sum it up. She said, that's a Band-Aid to make yourself feel better about what you've all known about and been silent witnesses to and or participants in that silence. And no, I don't forgive. Well, now Washington is taking up that tedious torch of fake protest. A group of Democratic lawmakers have announced that they're going to be wearing, wait for it, black in support of Time's Up in that movement at the State of the Union. Another reason not to watch. If it weren't for President Trump, I wouldn't. Must every moment of our communal life be overshadowed by protest? And then there's Oprah Winfrey. Now, I caught her speech on YouTube. I had a five-hour delay coming back from uh, the big game last night. Uh, it was nicely written, and it was well-delivered, her talk at the Golden Globes. But it was also purely political. Are we to believe that she, like Meryl Streep and all the other actresses, producers and so forth, just had their epiphanies about Weinstein, Spacey, and all the rest of them in Hollywood? Oprah, who, by the way, has spoke really compellingly about the abuse she suffered as a child, she had the biggest me megaphone in the media for decades. Surely she knew that both straight and gay men in Hollywood had abused their positions of power for years. There are victims all over the place. So my question is, what took them so long? Here's my angle on this. Since that Russia collusion narrative about President Trump hasn't materialized, and since all these predictions about the Trump Apocalypse haven't come true. The economy is doing so well. The left is desperately scrambling for anything to hold on to, anything to give them hope. So it's Oprah. She's their lifeline. 
Well, I say Oprah should throw her hat in the ring. Why not? The president apparently feels the same. Oprah would be a lot of fun. I know her very well. You know, I did one of her last shows. She had Donald Trump, this is before politics, her last week. And she had Donald Trump and my family it was very nice. No, I like Oprah. I don't think she's going to run. Look, Oprah's accomplished. She's fun to watch. She's smart. And I think she'll also quickly see just how different politics is from hosting a talk show. Different game. America isn't the room who gave her the standing O on Sunday night. And if she did run.